Hey, Solve the World fans, Danae Stack here. The month of July is our fundraising push, and unlike my husband, I'm not ashamed to ask you for money. So, if you value my husband's work and enjoy Solve the World, go to DanteStack.com, DanteStack.com, right now before you forget, and click on Tip Jar. If every one of the fans could just give what they can, we can continue making Solve the World. Thanks! previously on Solve the World. There's a mole. One of the workers is playing for the other side. <sighs> Merkel sighed. When I started the new curriculum here, I had half a mind to implement a similar policy for the adults. I ruled against the inclination, thinking it best to create loyalty among my paid. If you're correct, then uh, I see the error in my judgment. I assume you don't know the identity of this person? No. That's why he sent me. Merkel chewed on that response, testing its taste, trying his best to surmise if there was anything left unsaid in its fiber. So he sent you to discover him. Yes. Miles looked at a small, circular window. One of the only windows in all of Anmo. It was snowing now. Let me ask you the simplest question. He didn't tell me much about the operation, as I'm sure you can imagine. Merkel threw up his hands and smiled. By all means. The mission is much more than just extermination. Which... We do, by the way. Every Saturday, 1% of the residents at Anmo are sent on a train. Out of here. Where does the train go? Miles asked, just to push the conversation forward. It motors up 120 miles or so. Then... <coughs> Merkel clapped his hands and sneered. It stops. What's up there? Nothing. Tundra. Solve the World, a fictional adventure told in 100 episodes. You gotta let boys be boys. Episode 72, Judas in Our Midst. Cindy did it. It was Marshall who urged her on, but make no mistake, Cindy did it. If you still think me mad, you will think so no longer when I describe the wise precautions I took for the concealment of the body. The night waned and I worked hastily, but in silence. First of all, I dismembered the corpse. I cut off the head and the arms and the legs. And then, I then took up three planks from the flooring of the chamber and deposited all between the scantlings. I then replaced the board so cleverly, so cunningly, that no human eye, not even his, could have detected anything wrong. There was nothing to wash out, no stain of any kind, no blood spot, whatever. I had been too wary for that. A tub had caught all. Ha ha ha! When I had made an end of these labors, it was four o'clock. Still dark as midnight. As the bell sounded the hour, there came a knocking at the street door. I went down to open it with a light heart. For what had I now to fear? There entered three men who introduced themselves with, with perfect suavity, as officers of the police. A shriek had been heard by a neighbor during the night. Suspicion of foul play had been aroused. Information had been lodged at the police office. And they, the officers, had been deputed to search the premises. I smiled, for what had I to fear? I bade the gentlemen welcome. The constable stopped there, this reading from Edgar Allan Poe's The Telltale Heart, to be spooned out over the course of three separate meetings. Children, you must know this. Work, practice diligence, obey your civic duties, and you shall continue to live and serve here at Onmo. Do not betray your friends. Do not betray me. For I tell you, the destruction of property is no small matter. Whoever broke the Malandrinian machine, he is a demon among us. A Judas in our midst. I will find him. I will. Children, 
Don't make me do it. Don't make me search and destroy. It won't go well for any of us. The glorious light of Anma will come to only a flicker. Darkness will descend upon us. I, for one, do not fear the night. Worry not, I know how to pull us through it. How to parade Don's light into being once more. But you won't like the night. Not one bit. Children, find the perpetrator. End him. Bring him on his knees to my chamber, humbled and broken. Do this, or we will all need a little breaking. Truth be told, Constable never quite figured how to talk well to kids. He refused to use straight language, always preferring his flowery metaphors and veiled Poe quotes. If the constable wanted action, the speech did not have the lyrics it needed to have. No child looked for a demon that day. No one heeded constable's words. You see, the incident happened two days prior. Why? Because Marshall Winston was failing. After Rune Abdo was sent away on a train to who knows where, Marshall had three items on his agenda. One, kill Constable. Two, take out Killjoy and any other gang leaders, for good. Three, spark a rebellion. Full disclosure, items two and three naturally arose from Marshall's utter inability to get to the Constable. The ringleader seemed to vanish into thin air after each one of his little public manifestos. Getting at him was proving to be impossible. The reason was obvious. The constable had found him out. Marshal Winston walked the grounds of Anmo with a red X on his back. Besides the slow nod constable lasered at Marshal on that horrible day Rune was vanquished, there were other signs. Marshal was unable to make any connections, extract any info out of any of the other dolts. It wasn't quite the silent treatment, but it wasn't far off. A typical dolt conversation between Marshall and any other party went something like this. Marshall. Hey, can I ask you something? Random dolt. You can ask whatever you want. Random dolt then promptly walks away. End scene. Perhaps it was his hunger for vengeance or a consequence of his social isolation. But Marshall's voice was turning ever more dark, gravelly, cowboy Clint Eastwood-ish. His vocal cords had, for the most part, recovered from the burns he endured on his voyage deep in the middle of the earth. But the masked Batman voice continued. It was a sort of persona Marshall Winston was taking on, and he couldn't, or wouldn't, snap out of it. This brings us to little Cindy, the kid who started the fire. Metaphorically speaking, of course. The blonde-haired, blue-eyed girl that started the rebellion. But before we examine the plot points of the Great Children's Rebellion, a word of comparison between Miles Faw and Marshall Winston is due us, I think. Before Jennifer Dash thrust herself into the center of their lives, Marshall and Miles would have seen little in common with each other. Now, Marshall held down the fort at Anma while Miles sought out ways to keep the facility working and operational up and above the strong-arming will of Merkel and the Piper. Both men were fighting wars. Neither was sure of their particular role in the Great Symphony. Both had lost digits, literally. Marshall had lost his ring finger as a prize to gain access to Merlin, the long-ago fodderbeck of the Druidry Marshall calls home. Miles gnawed down both his ring finger and his pinky whilst under the heavy influence of the Windigo's cur. Intellectually, Miles was the superior cat, by more than a nose. After all, nobody ever wrote Marshall's name down on a genius list. Marshall was also lacking in the Department of Thought influence. He didn't maintain the parlor trick style voice modulation that Miles did. Where Marshall was able to keep up, though, was in two particular arenas. For one, although Miles' experience in life was vast, although he got to touch and feel the vast strangeness of this universe while still a youth, he never really got a sense of normalcy. 
For Miles Faw, the world was always a puzzle, a never-ending onion always ready to have another layer peeled off. This experience was not native to Marshall. He grew up in a world that was normal. The mailman always came, delivering bills, checks, and cut-out coupons. Dinner was served at 6 p.m., lunch at noon. Fairies belonged in fairy tales. Goblins and hobgoblins lived only within the confines of his bound copy of Lord of the Rings. Marshall grew up learning the world was often funny, sad, or pensive. Normal emotions for a normal world. This, when comparing Marshall to Miles, is Marshall's great advantage. He had a control group by which to compare his now completely odd experiences to. This is, for instance, quite dissimilar to Miles, who, for instance, accepted the Wendigo's hex immediately. Nothing within him contemplated, doubted, or raged against the reality of a self-cannibalism hex. This is the first arena of advantage for Marshall. The second is simpler to explain. Marshall had a keen sense of intuition. More than that, really. He naturally saw how everything fit together. Good Mr. Fa was so forever busy collecting every piece of unending data that seeing the forest for the trees was sometimes difficult. Marshall naturally saw the forest and understood its place within the greater ecosystem. That's why Marshall was able to see, almost from an instant, that in order to be a success, in order to accomplish his first two self-made tasks, kill Constable, take out Killjoy and his friends, sparking a rebellion was the only way forward. As a character in the great on mo play, as the dolt, Marshall Winston, he was hamstrung. Eyes were always on him. Constable was waiting for him to trip up. That's why Cindy had to be the linchpin. There were lots of Cindys at on mo actually. You didn't have to look far. Stories of runes and scouts are sad, of course, but they still comprise just slightly more than 1% of the population. Another 1-5% to remain in the throes of competition each week. The lucky souls born at the top of the food chain kids lucky enough to start with numbers near enough to smell the blueness. The blue kid, the top performer of the week, well, he or she had all the power, right? Even the lowliest creature among us is power hungry at its core. A fair middle portion of the population, a good 20 to 30 percent, found themselves grappling for power and meaning within the confines of a gang, a tribe, an identity. To start, Marshall knew not much could be done with that crowd. Another quarter to half of the population lived out their days in Anmo in fear, sometimes for no good reason. These are the children that walked about with anxiety monkeys constantly hanging on their backs. Some of these were the ones that rightfully feared their numbers might get smashed. Still others thought their number, 71, 144, 180 even, might not be enough this week. Even though there are 100 points over yellow lining, they still fear. It's the classic nightmare of coming to the SAT exam with a pencil with a number four lead, not number two. Who even has number four pencils? Answer, no one. It's an irrational fear. If you're a kid at Anmo and you start the week with the number 180, trust me, unless your device is smashed, you have nothing to fear. Yet many kids still did. Finally, the many Cindy's of Anmo were hidden in the cross-section of kids that didn't fit in any of the previously mentioned categories. I would say a good 20% of the population. These were the kids that played room ball, worked a little on the stationary bikes, ate well, and had no real reason to fear anyone. These were the ones that slipped between the cracks. No one noticed them. They were quite inconsequential. That's why Killjoy never bothered them. They didn't stand out enough to be bothered. Cindy was bored. She had nothing to look forward to. Marshall saw this in her and handed her a room ball bat. Malandrinian is produced in two identical manufacture centers located at opposite ends of Anmo. The large machine that splices together a hogwash mixture of chemicals, vitamins, and the lot has, near the middle of its room-filling operation, a small computer chip-controlled pipe. This small section of the machine is the most sophisticated of the whole operation. It squirts a specific bacteria in a very specific amount at the pre-Malandrinian compound. 
The bacteria eats away at the corners of the molecular structure of the food, causing it to become less dense. Constantly changing the amount that this squirts at the malandrinian changes the density of the overall product. Without this section, malandrinian comes out like overwrought burnt toast. It's like trying to eat a brick for lunch. This is precisely where little Cindy took aim with her bat. Little Cindy spent many long hours working in the Malandrinian factory each week, so it was commonplace to see her scooting around the middle of the factory machinery. No adult or child thought anything of the loud banging they heard come from the center of the room as Cindy breathlessly beat the snot out of this one particular pipe. Once the first machine was busted, Cindy gracefully strutted out to the other end of Onmo and repeated her swats of power at the other Malandrinian maker. Of course, there was plenty of stock Malandrinian to go around, but these high-tech parts of the machine were not easily replaceable. It would take hundreds and hundreds of man-hours in testing to replace the malfunctioning units, meaning, by necessity, before too long, brick-hard Malandrinian would be forced to make the rounds. Cindy did it. It was Marshall who urged her on, but make no mistake, Cindy did it. The first direct consequence of Cindy's deviance was the constable's Find the demon among us speech. Constable made a vital error, though, in assuming the demon was male. No one yet suspected Cindy. She had power in her veins now. She wanted the glory. The glory that only now appeared to her as attainable. Marshall, for his part, never actually spoke to her. All he did was leave notes. She never knew who they were from. The note she found under her pillow the night after the constable's speech read, You are special. Next time, leave a mark. Defy him, and others will follow. You alone are our hope. Take out the power. Marshall wrote in all caps to try to cover up his remarkably atrocious handwriting. On the last line, Marshall wrote just one word, in scribbled lowercase for emphasis. He wrote just three letters, J-O-I. Cindy followed orders, better than Marshall could have ever hoped. The stationary bike room helps power Onmo. Children pedal in the kinetic energy in part with coal power that's pumped out of the northeastern end of the facilities. Keep Onmo warm and operational, keeps electricity on. What Cindy did there was far more brilliant than Marshall ever anticipated. There's a particular solvent used in the Malandrinian labs. This solvent is extremely powerful. Touch almost anything with it and the nasty stuff will work its magic, usually melting a hole through whatever it comes in contact with. With non-flinching hands, Cindy squirted small amounts of the stuff onto half of the stationary bikes. She probably used a pipette, holding the solvent in her hands while pedaling the bike and surreptitiously spraying the stuff on its intended target. This target was the connecting wires that leveraged the biking into energy. It took the better part of three days before Cindy's genius exploit was uncovered. She'd burned away the connecting wires, yes, but all the bikes still worked normally. Hop on one and you'd never know that everything wasn't hunky-dory. But that's not all. The real chicanery was the message that Cindy left. On the floor of the bike room, right by the entrance, she sprayed the solvent. It didn't burn through the floor entirely, but it did stain and bruise the metal false wood floor. The stain was three letters. J-O-I. Joy. Cindy had made it her calling card. Marshall couldn't have been prouder. If the first incident received just one little old speech as reciprocation, you could take it to the bank that the constable wouldn't let a second offense fly by without a punishing response. Fool me once, shame on you. Twice? All of Onmo's congregation was called to the greenhouse. High from the rafters, Constable stood overlooking his minions like normal. But today, as he grimaced at the masses, there was a fellow with him. A punk kid. Killjoy. The one and only. Stood beside Constable. Constable held a book in his hands. He opened it to a thumb-marked page, continuing on with the Poe story. The shriek, I said, was my own in a dream. The old man, I mentioned, was absent in the country. I took my visitors all over the house. I bade them search, search well. 
I led them, at length, to his chamber. I showed them his treasures, secure, undisturbed. In the enthusiasm of my confidence, I brought chairs into the room, and desired them here to rest from their fatigues, while I myself, in the wild audacity of my perfect triumph, placed my own seat upon the very spot beneath which reposed the corpse of the victim. The constable smiled wryly. He closed the book and slapped one arm around the figure standing dumbly beside him. State your name. Let the children know whom I favor. Ellis. Ellis Richards. No, my son. State the name you go by. The name that holds your glory. The kid shivered under Merkel's strong embrace. He didn't understand what the constable meant by your glory. <sighs> your gang name, Merkel grunted. Uh, Kildroy. Come on, shout it! Killjoy! Say it again! Louder! Killjoy! Don't say kill, just the last part now! The device-smashing gang leader didn't see where this was going. He was happy to play along. Joy! Joy! Merkel rang out in symphony with the boy, and with that, he tossed the boy over the rafter. He fell 40 feet, splattered on impact. There is no joy at Anmo. You think you could break the world? I own the world! If anything else happens, every yellow will be excommunicated this Saturday. Banished from Anmo. It's your choice. Stay here. Live in peace. Live according to my generous leniency. Or face deportation. That was the speech. The murder of Killjoy got to Cindy. She'd be useless from now on. She cried herself to sleep that night, knowing now in her heart the cost of any subversion was too scary. That was A-OK -okay to Marshall. Cindy had played her part. Her role was finished. He didn't need her anymore. Killjoy's gang didn't need much of a push. They knew this much. They didn't start the fire. They didn't break the Malandrinian machines. They didn't cut the bike circuits. Yet Constable clearly elected their leader, Killjoy, as the fall guy for this subversive movement. The next week was going to be dangerous. Since they didn't know who wrote Joy, they couldn't predict whether Constable's threat would become a reality or not. 10%. That's 20 out of 200. All the yellows. 20 out of less than 200. Some in Killjoy's gang started their week yellow lining. Killjoy himself, he started every week with a single-digit nine. That's why they started the Smashings in the first place. One thing remained clear to the Killjoys. Smashings weren't the problem, but they might be a solution. Killjoy's successors started bright and early Monday morning, smashing every device they could find. They took pipes out of the bathrooms, wrenched them out from the walls behind the toilets, threatened any kid who didn't hand over their device. Smashy mix smash lessons. Over a thousand devices smashed on just day one. It was only Monday. As you can probably imagine, the Killjoys weren't the only gang at Anmo. But they were the most well-known, certainly now. A boy named Ponder, head of a gang of eight boys that called themselves the Wraiths, came up with a plan. First, recruit anyone who had their device smashed by the Killjoys. Show Ponder a smashed device and you've got yourself a membership. Wraiths, as one gelatinous blob, all worked in the coal plant section of Anmo. As a sign of membership, they chalked coal marks around their eyes. Really, most of them looked more like raccoons than malevolent spirits, but, you know, calling yourself the Wraiths is a smidgen more fear-inducing than the raccoons. By Friday, the Wraiths' membership was in the hundreds. 
Any stranger walking around Anmo that day would think there was some low-budget chimney sweep scene from Mary Poppins being filmed. All these soot-addled kids running around. But the design wasn't just for show, it was for action. Strategically, on Friday, Ponder executed a takedown. Every known killjoy was taken captive, duct taped from head to toe to a bed, leaving only a small section of the stomach open. Each killjoy's device was found, smashed, and then, to ensure further humiliation, J.O.I. was etched out in coal on each killjoy's stomach. Ponder made sure some dolts saw the letters written on the loser gang's stomachs. He thought that if the word joy, J-O-I, made an encore appearance, Constable would be outraged. He'd purge Anmo of all these killjoys. And with this, the race would make sure that every last killjoy was ostracized, sent on that glorious farewell train. This was the plan. But the Constable had a completely other plan. Magnanimously, he spoke that Saturday, not from an archaic poem. He did not speak of Lost Lenore, or some hideous soul-eating worm. He spoke well. He said, Friends, last week, I convicted you. I told you that insufferable crimes were being committed here in our lovely home. I warned you. Acting as the good boys and girls that you are, you listened and acted. You found the gang members, the guilty ones. You worked together like the many threads of a rope that will not break. And you isolated the guilty ones. I applaud you. You've done well. As a prize of your good conduct, the trains shall not come. All red lines shall be ignored. No one shall leave Anmo this week. The crowd below collectively scratched their heads. Was this good? Was this what they wanted? The Killjoys would stay. That was bad, but no one had to leave. That was good. If there could be grace one week, there could be grace another. Maybe next week the constable would be happy with us again. Maybe no one has to leave ever again. That was not just good, but great. Right? For Marshal Winston, this was the worst of all worlds. Marshall hated this man who dared to speak just a few days after murdering a child, as if he himself is the messiah of the orphans. I say only this, my precious children, Merkel the constable boomed. Do not wage any more vengeance on the ones who favor themselves in the likeness of a dead man. Do not raise a finger of threat any longer to the killjoys. Let them rest. Be at peace. Live contentedly here. Add on, though. This was blasphemy. The constable was tricking the children. It couldn't stand. It wouldn't. And so Marshall made sure of it this time. He himself snuck into the coal plant. He literally took all the gum he could find and diligently gummed up every chimney pipe the plant had to offer. This pushed that horrible, toxic soot air throughout the many myriad underground chambers of Anmo. Marshall made sure also to write the word on one of the chimneys with some of the duct tape that was used a day before to bed down the rival gang. He wrote, Killjoy. Joy, spelled with an I. Toxic fumes everywhere. Panic. Still, it wasn't enough. Marshall found Teller, the second in command of the Killjoys. Under the guise of the coal haze, he told the gullible kid that the Wraiths did it and were framing the Killjoys. That's why their name was written in the coal plant. Teller didn't know what to do. He looked to Marshall like he wasn't going to do anything at all. Look, your leader was killed. Ellis was your captain, your decision maker. Ponder is the leader of the race. Take him out, and you've cut off the head of the snake. You've evened the game. And there'll be peace then? It's the only way. As Teller made plans, Marshall feverishly spread the rumor that Ponder would stop at nothing, that he was mad that all of the wraiths were mad. The rumors spun the story like this. The Killjoys weren't just framed for this, they were framed for everything. The wraiths, and when I say wraiths, I mean only the original eight, were the real enemies. And Ellis, the supposed original Killjoy, 
he was actually an undercover rake. If you wanted things to be right, you had to switch sides. Look what Ponder did to the Killjoys anyway. Tortured them, essentially. Pretty much, right? Duct taped them down to the beds? That's bad. Floods of kids switched teams. Still others joined up with the race for the first time, fearing a two-party war left outsiders enemies of both sides. Ponder was dead by morning. The gang war had begun. Anmo had gone full Lord of the Flies. Equipment all across the underground facilities was ruined, destroyed. The ever-escalating game of one-upsmanship now had no end. Couldn't have an end. Meanwhile, Marshall was working. The new leader of the Wraiths, a girl named Bernice, had her ear to his mouth. Marshall was no miles far. He couldn't simply order people to unwittingly do his bidding. But he could direct their anger. Despite all the chaos, that week the constable was nowhere to be found. On a Thursday afternoon, a peace summit was held. Bernice met with Teller. The Wraiths and the Killjoys were negotiating. Marshall somehow supplanted himself as the intermediary, both sides thinking he was their ace in the hole, the one true dolt who cared enough to take sides, and both sides thought he was on theirs. There's not enough time now to cover all that was spoken of at the powwow. The gist, though, of Marshall's speech went something like this. It's too late. Even if everyone stops fighting, it's too late. You know, the one thing that Constable can't stand is for his equipment to be damaged. The coal plant is still down. Every hallway is stained irrevocably with soot. The cafeteria looks like a war zone. Malandrinian dispensers are busted. The vice counters have been gutted. There's simply no going back. But listen, now you know how powerful you are. If your two gangs combined, together we could take out the real villain. I don't think either side plugged up the coal factory. I don't think either side started writing J-O-I everywhere. Tell her, you know this. The Killjoys have always spelled their name K-I-L-L-J-O-Y. Not J-O-I. Who do you think started it all? There's only one suspect. He's been sending everyone away. Onto the trains. Because he wants Anmo for himself. He never loved you. We need to start with the greenhouse. Pete will take me back again. He's mellowed out and hiring, and I've sold out and I am looking. They did. The children destroyed the greenhouse, took every throwable object they could find, and launched it at the ceiling. The rafters fell. Cause mom and daddy, they got money, but not enough to make life funny. I got an education, girl, just made me smart about this stupid world. No longer would Constable yell down to them from on high. They were a mom. Another one or two of my best friends. Cause I had plans to do great things With this bottle in my hand And this knuckle by my ring And I don't know, I don't know So all the little children go Except every door I open or I close Well I used to work for a girl She sat behind a glass table I thought she was a woman or a wounded animal And she would call to me from the den Show me her white fangs again And I'd return the silver tray back to the kitchen Cause she had money and just enough to make me bend, bow, kneel, and bluff. And I don't know, I don't know, so all the Roger Daltries go. Well, I tried to be a priest, but there was too much to believe. So I tried to be intellectual, but that wasn't very sensual. I tried manual labor, I even mowed my mother's lawn for her. She just gave me $20 and told me not to quit my day job. I said, fine, mom, I'd rather be a bum, because at least bums have more fun. She said, without health insurance, you'll just end up with a broken arm. Let's give them broken bones and student loans, that brand new guitar. That don't sound like much of a rock star. Seek and destroy, plunder and ravage. That was the heart of every child in Anmo. Yes, even the sweetest soul, 
an agent of chaos now. Winter, spring, summer, fall. I found it hard to screw it all. I tore my jeans and ripped my sleeves, put tattoos on my arms and knees. There's comfort in the office chair. I put more gel into my hair. There's open mic, nice slutty scenes to fill my horny rock star dreams. There's lost and found little children all around. And if you're born above the middle, you still end up underground. And I don't know, I don't know. So all the little children go. I don't know So all the Roger Daltries go I don't know Future generations may look back at the rebellion and wonder why. Psychologists will use this story as a litmus test to explain that all of mankind, at the very bottom of all things, is innately evil. The truth is different than that, though. Everyone wants, nay, yearns, for the world to be just. When life proves itself not to be so, when the shape of things inevitably makes itself apparently rigged, ultimately broken, we, at least as spiritual beings, are destroyed. And so we want to rage. We would all rage. You, me, everyone. If only we didn't fear the consequences of our actions. So do not blame the children. The world is broken. Say it again until you believe it. The world is broken. Who broke it? Most of the dolts working at Anmo were killed, caught up in the middle. Some purposefully, some just by accident. Amidst the pillaging, a seldom used intercom system sprang to life. The constable's voice in tow. My children, I am leaving. I am fleeing for my life. Leaving on the train. It seems I've been chosen in the lottery. I am headed now the same way all the red line children have gone. You have been turned astray. May you choose a wise leader in my stead. Please, now grant an old man one last excerpt. Over the intercom, the constable read the final lines of Poe's telltale heart. It read, The officers were satisfied. My manner had convinced them. I was singularly at ease. They sat, and while I answered cheerily, they chatted of familiar things. But, ere long, I felt myself getting pale and wished them gone. My head ached, and I fancied a ringing in my ears. But still they sat and still chatted. It continued and became more distinct. I talked more freely to get rid of the feeling. But it continued and gained definiteness until, at length, I found that the noise was not within my ears. No doubt I grew very pale, but I talked more fluently and with a heightened voice, yet the sound increased. And what could I do? It was a low, dull, quick sound, much such a sound as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I gasped for a breath, and yet the officers heard it not. I talked more quickly, more vehemently, but the noise steadily increased. I arose and argued about trifles, in a high key and with violent gesticulations. But the noise steadily increased. Why would they not be gone? I paced the floor to and fro with heavy strides, as if excited to fury by the observations of the men. But the noise steadily increased. Oh God, what could I do? I foamed, I raved, I swore. I swung the chair upon which I had been sitting and grated it upon the boards. But the noise arose over all and continually increased. It grew louder, louder, louder. And still the men chatted pleasantly and smiled. Was it possible they heard not? Almighty God, no, no. They heard, they suspected, they knew. They were making a mockery of my horror. This I thought and this I think. But anything was better than this agony. Anything was more tolerable than this derision. I could bear those hypocritical smiles no longer. I felt that I must scream or die. And now, again, hark, louder, louder, louder. Villains, I shrieked. Dissemble no more. I admit the deed. Tear up the planks. Here, here is the beating of his hideous heart. With that, the voice was gone. The train was leaving. Constable Merkel was gone. In his place, the children elected Marshall as new constable at Anmo. Marshall was no miles far. His intuition leads him and fails him. 
A children's rebellion was always what the Piper wanted, always what he asked Merkel to orchestrate. Rune Abdo was the pawn, the innocent, that revealed the enemy's position. And now Merkel was free to investigate what Miles was up to. Why had he been gone so long? Perhaps a train ride north will bring answers. I don't know. Guys, this episode, I was so, 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 so excited to get the chance to utilize in this episode a song by my favorite musician, Richard McGraw. The song is called Silver Trays, and it's one of many gems from Richard McGraw's new album called How to Suffer. Please, please, please visit his Bandcamp page at richardmcgraw.bandcamp.com. You can download all his albums there or specific tracks if you prefer. I found this guy through Pandora about a decade ago uh, and have been addicted to his songs ever since. What I love about Richard McGraw's music is the depth to his lyricism and the vulnerability he expresses in every single track. I've never met the man, but I feel like he's a close friend because I've felt the burden of his life and the ups and downs through his five albums that he's released. Uh over the duration of his career. If you don't want to go to Bandcamp, you can, of course, find him on iTunes or look him up on Facebook. That's Richard McGraw. Uh, and, of course, all the other music and sound effects are appropriately attributed this week on DanteStack.com. Uh, I look forward to incorporating a couple more songs in the coming weeks of Richard McGraw's work, and I'm delighted, absolutely delighted and honored to be able to use his music and solve the world. Thank you, Richard, and please... Give this guy a listen. All right, see you next week. Mm -hmm.